Micaiah, if you'll take your Bibles, please, this morning and go to uh, Psalm 118, please. Psalm 118, right about the middle part of your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms. Psalm 118. I want to give you a message this morning. It will not be long at all. I know it's a time change Sunday. I know some of you are a little bit weary, more weary than normal on a Sunday morning, and I understand that. By the way, it's, it's just as early on this side of the pulpit as it is on that side. I lost just as much sleep as you did. So we're going to be all right today, but I want to go quickly, and I want you to listen. I want to help you this morning. I think I will, through God's Word, of course, in Psalm 118. And I'm going to have you look at just one verse with me. It's a familiar verse to us. It's often, I think, misapplied. And I don't think in a, in a bad way, but I, I think uh, in, in the misapplication, we miss out on the, the truth that this verse really holds, and I want to give you that truth today. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning, in just a moment, about how can I rejoice in this day? How can I rejoice in this day? The truth of the matter is, there's many difficult days in our lives. Uh, we, we, you might be having... A, a maybe just not today and by day I mean a, a, a bad time, a bad stretch. Sometimes uh, that day goes into days and weeks and months. There are bad stretches of life. Yet the Bible says this is the day that the Lord hath made. We're to rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, oftentimes I think we, we can look at our day and say, God, how in the world am I to rejoice in this? How, how can I rejoice in what I'm going through? Uh, I, I think of our good folks up the hill in our, our church there, and uh, I think in just that little band of believers, uh, several that, that have cancer and diabetes, and uh, uh, just many that are struggling up there and have struggled. And in our church here, I know there's many struggles that are represented by you today. And uh, again, we, we look at our, our days sometimes, and those tough days, and, and we know that God's told us to rejoice in them. This is the day that the Lord hath made it. But how, how in the world can I rejoice in what I'm going through? God, how can you expect me to be happy about uh, what I'm dealing with right now? Uh, how can I rejoice in this day? Look at that great verse 24 with me. Psalm 118, verse 24. And I'll give you about four reasons today, or four uh, things that we uh, must realize, I think, to rejoice in the days that God allows. Verse 24, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to have you look up uh, verse 22. The Bible says, The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118, these verses are actually prophetic verses. They're pointing towards Calvary. And they're reminding us that one day Jesus was going to come. He was going to die on the cross. And he would be that, that stone which was rejected. And he would become, though, the, the cornerstone, if you will, uh, uh, the head cornerstone. Uh, the headstone of the corner, but he would be rejected. He would be a rejected Savior. He came into his own, his own received him not. Uh, so these are prophetic, prophetic verses that we're looking forward to Calvary. And verse 24 is actually talking about that day. It's talking about the, the day that Jesus was going to come and die on the cross. That was the day that the Lord has made. The day that God ordained, the Father ordained for Jesus to die and suffer on the cross. And God said, because of that day, we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I think that's very easy that when we look to Calvary today, those of us that know what that day means, we know that without that day, we'd be on our way to hell. Without that day, we'd have no hope. Without that day of Christ dying for us on the cross and shedding His blood, we'd have absolutely no hope today. Our whole faith is built on that day. So I think it's very easy for us to look back at that day and say, oh, oh yeah, God, no, I've got no problem rejoicing in that day. I realize that was the day that you made. That was the day that you ordained for your son to die. And it, it was a very difficult day for him. It was a very hard day for him. But we can look back and rejoice. You ought to look back. We ought to be able to look back and say, you know what? That was the, probably the greatest day of my life. I mean, without that day, again, I, I'd be on my way to hell. I know without that day, I would have never met my wife. Because I got saved, I went to a Bible college, my wife was there. Uh, uh, we would have never met each other had it not been for that day. This church wouldn't exist had it not been for that day. 
Uh, all the good things that have ever happened in our life have happened because of that day. And certainly we can rejoice in the day that Jesus died. But the application here also is in our lives that we're going to have days that are tough days, like Christ endured. But, but two, those days are ordained to the Lord. And in our tough days, God requires us to rejoice in those days. I want to apply Calvary in that day to the tough times that we go through in our lives and the command by God that we are to rejoice and be glad in it. The truth of the matter is, if we could go back in time on that day that Jesus died on the cross and interview especially those men and the, 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 the women that followed him more, most closely in his earthly ministry, I guarantee if we were to ask them as they, well, of course, many have forsook him and fled. There was a handful of ladies, uh, his own mother was there at the cross and some of the other Marys were there and uh, uh, the Apostle John was there, the others were uh, uh, far off and some again had forsook, forsook him totally. But if we could have went to that day when Jesus was on the cross dying for the sins of the world and asked those people that had pinned their hopes and dreams on that man, they did not understand yet fully, although he tried to instruct them over and over again that he was the King of Kings, he was the Savior, and he was going to die and be buried and uh, be raised from the dead. They never quite grasped that truth. All they knew that day was the man that they pinned all their hopes on was dead. He was hanging on a cross. In fact, Peter, one of his closest followers, got, became very discouraged and, and actually after that went back into his old occupation. Uh, and, and I think we fault Peter a whole lot, but you've got to understand, here's a man that left everything that he had to follow the man who said he was the Savior, he's the Messiah. And, and, and these men, literally, they left their, their, their families, they left their jobs, they left their livelihoods, they left their security, and they said, we believe in you, Jesus, and, and we're going to follow you. And, and now that day, that guy's dead. And some of those men did exactly what we would do. We, we, we want to get our security back. Well, certainly we need to go back to our jobs. We need to go back to the old world. We need to make a living again because the man that we just followed and left everything for is, is, is not here anymore. And if we would have said to those men on that day, can I interview Peter? What do you think about this day? I guarantee you Peter said, this has got to be the one of the worst days of my life. Well, why do you say that, Peter? Well, because the man that I just left everything for is dead. How do you feel, John? How do you feel, James? How do you feel, Mary? Three days later, though, can I say this? If we interviewed him again, they probably said, that's the best day. Oh, exactly. I didn't realize it then, but bless God. Uh, I remember Jesus talking about that. I remember him giving us this, the, the, the parables, and I, we never really pulled it together. But now I, it makes sense. He is the Savior. He, he was who he, he, he is who he claimed to be. And boy, that you would ask me three days ago how I felt, it's the worst day. You ask me now how I felt, it's the best day because I realized because of that day, He is God, He is the Savior, uh, He is the Messiah. And those men and those band of Christians went out and they turned the world upside down because of that day. Sometimes on our bad days, if I was to interview you, and we were to interview each other, we'd say, how do you feel today? you say, gosh, this got to be the worst day of my life. But sometimes we too can look back and say, you know what, that is the best day, one of my best. I did not like it then. It was very painful, very shameful, very hurtful. So we've got to be very careful about looking at our days uh, because what we think sometimes is the worst day might turn out to be the best day. And that's why we're commanded by God to rejoice and be glad in it. How can I rejoice, Pastor, in this day? How can I rejoice in what I'm going through? As we compare it to Calvary, let me give you four quick points today. We will not be long. Listen carefully, please. Number one, we've got to realize in those days, those tough days, as was on Calvary, God had allowed it, and God's will is always best. I don't have to agree with it today. I don't have to agree with what God's doing all the time. I just have to realize that God's allowed it to happen. And whatever God allows to happen in my life is the best thing. I'm not talking about the bad days that we have because of our sins, but I'm talking about that we're just going about the normal course of our life. We love the Lord. We're doing what God wants us to do. And God, for whatever reason, in His uh, 
foreknowledge and his love for us and his care for us allow some very difficult things to come into our lives. Could he have kept Calvary from happening? Certainly. Would mankind have plunged into the depths of hell? Yes. Aren't you glad he didn't keep that day from happening? And he doesn't keep all those Calvary days from happening in our lives, all those crucifixion days from happening in our lives either. And, and, and yet, in the midst of it, he says, rejoice. How can I rejoice? Well, number one, I, I, I don't rejoice because I agree with it. I don't even, might not even understand it. I don't like it. It's not the best thing for me. It hurts. Shameful. But I realize God allowed it. I've got to have something in my heart in the, back, in the recesses of my mind that say, you know what, God? I have no clue what you're doing right now. Just as those men and women didn't have any clue what was going on really fully that day when Christ hung on the cross, uh, we too look at our days and say, God, what in the world are you doing? But God, I realize, listen, you've allowed it. If you've allowed it, your will is always best. Do you agree today that God's will is better than your will? Can you believe that God's de uh, agree today that God's decisions are better than yours? That God's ways are higher than ours? And because of that, we can rejoice. God allows those days for a number of different reasons. We're not going to get into this too in depth today, but maybe it's to make me stronger. I can rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Uh, God, because you're going to make me stronger. Someone has said, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. Uh, sometimes you might feel like you're going to die on those days, but, but, but it'll, it'll make you better. Maybe it'll make you wiser. Maybe it'll make you need Him more. Maybe it'll make you more faithful. Maybe those tough times will cause you to realize, you know, I need to be more faithful to church. Then that's a good day. Amen. You should rejoice. Uh, maybe it'll drive, drive you to your Bible. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. That I might learn my statutes. Boy, if that bad day takes me to the Word of God, that's a good day. You ask me that day if I think it's good, I'm going to probably tell you you're nuts. Uh, you ask me down the road, when I see what God did because of that day, I'll tell you it was a good day. And don't miss rejoicing in your bad, quote-unquote, day-to-day. It might make you stronger, better, wiser, more needier of Him, or more faithful. But it's the day that God's allowed. And God's will is always best. Whatever you might be going through today. Can I say, secondly, just as it was on Calvary that day that you are experiencing that God says you must rejoice in it, no matter how tough it is, is needed to help you complete your mission. Christ had to go to the cross to complete the very reason he came in the first place. And God has a purpose and a mission for every one of you. And, and sometimes, again, God has to allow things to enter our lives to make us stronger, to make us wiser, to make us more faithful, to make us more knowledgeable so that we can handle the mission for which he's given us. We're going to see this in just a moment as we go to the next point, but, but God has Sunday today that you need to reach. God has Sunday today that, that He wants you to get the gospel to. God has a, 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 a uh, purpose and a plan for your life that, 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 that today perhaps you're not capable of fulfilling, so God has to allow some difficult days to come in your life to give you the strength and the know-how and the, the spiritual uh, 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 determination and, and the, 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 the need in Him for you to complete that mission. I look at many hard days of my life and, and, and again, at, uh, during those times, God, there is no way those, th those, those were good days. But I look back now and I've seen how God has used those bad experiences to help me to reach others who have also gone through those similar experiences. Don't miss that. That's why you ought to rejoice and be glad no matter what you're going through. You realize that somebody, God has people that you can reach that I can't reach. You know, we've got to get past this mindset that says, you know what, if I don't reach somebody, somebody else will reach them. If God really wants them to go to heaven, somebody's going to cross their path and witness to them. That's not in the Bible. By the way, God wants everybody to go to heaven. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calvinist, hyper-Calvinist doctrine that said God chooses some to go to heaven, some to go to hell, that's unbiblical. Uh, for whosoever, anybody wants to get saved, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That means God wants everybody to trust Christ as Savior. In fact, the very reason that Jesus delays in his coming uh, is, is because he's not willing that any should perish. He wants more people to get saved. But I can't win who you, you are, who you are ordained to win. I can't reach who you are ordained to reach, and you can't reach who God's ordained for me to reach. God allows circumstances in our lives because in His foreknowledge, uh, 
He knows that people are going to in our lives that we can take those same experiences and help them because they too have struggled with those types of days. Are you with me today? Those tough times can be used by God as you use them properly uh, to, to, to reach people for Christ. I'm amazed in my life how many people God puts in my path that when I talk to them at their door as I'm trying to get the gospel of them, they, they, they see a guy sometimes in a suit and a tie and short hair and they're thinking, this guy has no clue what, I'm, what kind of life I'm living. This guy has no idea what I'm going through. And I'll get to talk to them a little bit and get them to open up a little bit and uh, I've talked to many young men over the years, 24, 25, 26, 27 year old men that, that are thinking, this old guy, this old preacher has no idea. And I get to talking to those guys and find out they're struggling with alcohol and struggling with this and struggling with that. And I'll give my testimony and they'll stand there and say, I had no idea. You do know what I'm going through. I'm able to win them to Christ. Am I glad I had all those bad, sinful days? No. Am I encouraging you to have those sinful days? No. Uh, those are bad days. But I can rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because God's used those days. And God will use them in your life. Uh, it, those days are needed to help us complete our mission. God has a purpose for you. Your purpose isn't here just to make money. And your purpose is here just to uh, get enveloped in the things of this world. God wants to use us, Christian people. God wants to use your life to reach others for Christ. Be very careful that the Christian life isn't a sideline. This is the main thing right here. I pick on you just a little bit in love. This is the main thing. Christianity in church is not just something that we get to when everything else is done. This is it. This is the main thing. There shouldn't be a, a carnal life and a spiritual life. All of our lives should be spiritual. We, sh we shouldn't segregate, you know, well, I got work here and uh, uh, play here and sports here and then the Christian life over here. You blend all those together under the umbrella of the spiritual life. This is what we're here for. The things of God. That's why you ought to come back Sunday night. That's why you ought to come back Wednesday night. That's why you ought to look very carefully at your life and, and make sure that the world's not taking you and distracting you away from God's business. You're not reading your Bible. You're not, in the, you're not praying. You're too busy. Be careful. You've got to look at your life. and be, the, Christianity's become a sideline. It's the main event. You've let the sidelines take you away from the main event. I'm not mad at you, Dan. You say we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that we don't get off track of what this thing's all about. Why are we here? We're here for the Lord Jesus Christ and to point as many other people to Him as we can before He comes again. Amen. We need to live accordingly and realize that everything that God allows us to help us complete that mission, that's why I can rejoice and be glad in it. Because God can use us down the road to help me reach somebody. God can use it to help me be better. And God can use it to help me point others to Him. Thirdly today is this, how can I rejoice in those tough days as Christ uh, experienced on Calvary and His tough day? Number three, although it might not be the best thing for me, listen very carefully, although it might not be the best thing or the best day for me, listen, it could be the best thing that ever happens to other people. Was it best that Jesus had to die on a cross? No. Was it best that he had to suffer? Was it best? Every time I read the, the, the uh, crucifixion story in the Gospels, it, it angers me. It angers me that people came up and spit in Jesus' face. That makes me mad. It, it hurts me that, that people beat him and mock him. It hurts me that they took a crown of thorns and placed it on my Savior's head and put a scepter in his hand and, and a robe on his back and, and, and then they took their very hands and smote him across the face and spat on him and, and mocked his kingship. It angers me that they put nails in his hands and his feet and he suffered and bled and died and was tortured unlike anybody who's ever been tortured. That bothers me. Was that the best thing for Jesus Christ? No. But because he did that and allowed that to happen... Is that not the best thing that ever happened to us? Yes. And i got to realize, by the way, that's Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. That verse doesn't say that when I'm having a bad day, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. That's crazy. If you get cancer, for me to come up to you and say, you know what? That's the best thing that could ever happen to you. You should be happy. You have every right to punch me in the face for that. 
I told you the story when we were in Bible college in our apartment flood. We lived in northwest Indiana. It was raining all night. Our drains outside in our cul-de-sac uh, plugged up and water was building up outside our apartment. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to work. Our carpet was squishy from the water that was seeping in from the, the closet. I called our landlord that lived right above us in the next floor and uh, of course, uh, like any good husband, he sent his wife down at 4 o'clock in the morning to see what was going wrong and he stayed in bed. And uh, she comes into our bedroom and uh, showed her the carpet there and I showed her where it was coming through, uh, the, 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 the closet, and we, we had a garage that, that our bedroom door actually went out into a garage and that garage opened up into the cul-de-sac. And uh, she wanted to see what was going on outside, where all this water was coming from. Big, big mistake. She pushed that garage door opener, and the door began to rise, and all the water that the garage door was keeping out now rushed into our apartment. And we went from just having a little bit of dampness in our carpet within 30 seconds having about a foot of water there. And it flooded our whole apartment completely. And I remember sitting up on top of our couch and, you know, talking on the phone and letting my boss know I could come into work today. And, you know, water everywhere and much of our stuff destroyed. They were Christian people. I'll never forget her later that afternoon as we were up in her apartment. She said, Todd and Lydia, she says, don't forget Romans 8, 28. She said, all things work together for good. And I thought, yeah, that's easy for you to say. You live on the second floor. Your apartment's dry. Was that the best thing that could have happened to us? No. We've used that story over and over again. God did such amazing things in, through that story and gave us... Uh, uh, a new place to live. And God, God did so many amazing things that we've used to help others with their faith. But listen, that wasn't the best thing for us. But if we use it properly, it could be the best thing for others. That's Calvary. Is it best that Jesus was spit on? No, that angers me. That makes me mad. Well, am I glad he did it? Yes. Why? Because it's the best thing for me. Because 22 years ago when I decided to come to him and trust him as my Savior and I got saved and began to change my life and gave me a home in heaven, that, folks, was the best day of my life. It wasn't the best thing for Jesus, but it was the best thing for me. And that's why we can rejoice in our days. Because no matter how hurtful and painful it might be, I would be foolish to tell you that's the best thing that could happen to you. You just don't know it yet. It might not be the best thing. It just Romans 8.28 doesn't say that. It says that it can work out for good. It can become the best thing for others. You can use your bad day and help it to be a good day for a lot of people. Are you with me today? You can use your bad experiences. You can use that cancer. Is that the best thing for you? No. No. Uh, uh, but you can use that to help others and encourage others with that. You can use that bad past uh, you can use those bad experiences to be the best thing for others and help them with their faith and encourage them and appoint them to Jesus. And so use your days, dear people of God, and rejoice in them, realizing, God, there's some folks down the road that I can certainly help with this. Many, many years ago, there's a little baby that was taken to the hospital by her mother and father that had some problems in her eyes, and the nurse misdiagnosed the treatment and put some eye... Uh, ointment on her eyes that burned that little baby's eyes and immediately caused blindness and that baby grew up blind her whole life. At the age of 12, I believe it was, she wrote a little plump, a poem and said, uh, uh, talk about rejoicing in, in, in the fact of her blindness and how happy she was uh, because of what God's allowed. And that little baby grew up to be uh, one of the great hymn writers in, in our American uh, history, a lady by the name of Fanny Crosby. And there's a little baby that, 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 that grew up into adulthood that said, I'm going to take probably the worst day of my life. Was it the best thing? You tell that mom and dad that day at the hospital, oh, don't worry, that's the best thing that could ever happen to her. They had every right to punch you in the face too. Don't tell me that my baby just got blinded. She's going to grow up blind and that's the best thing. But did that little baby that grew up into that young lady turn that into the best thing for many others? Certainly. I'm sure glad that she wrote all those hymns and never got better against God. I'm sure glad that she wrote, and I shall see him face to face. And tell us. They, they interviewed her in a big conference, and, and the pastor said, Miss Crosby said, if God can answer any prayer, what would it be? She, she mentioned something else. He said, I, I'm surprised. He said, I thought you'd want God to, to give you your eyesight back. She said, oh, no, sir. He said, how come? She said, because I want the first person I ever see to be Jesus Christ. I don't want God to give me my eyesight. How do you feel, Mom and Dad, that day in the hospital, the worst day of our lives? Fast forward many years down the road, and all the hymns that that lady helped, and all the, the stories of faith that she inspired through her life. 
And how do you feel about the day? It's a good day. We have no idea. Good day, bad day. You just need to rejoice and be glad. Number four today, and we're done. Stay with me. It can be and should bring me closer to the Father and to His Word. It can and should bring me closer to the Father and to His Word. Now I know as Jesus hung on the cross, hung on the cross that day that the Father literally had to turn His back on Jesus as He took the sins of the world upon Himself. But it was because of that that Jesus eventually got to go back to the Father. That day reunited Him after a while with the Father. In every day of our lives, listen, if you don't get any of those points, you ought to get this one. That day, that, that tough day, that tough time, that tough month, that tough stress, that phone call that you get, and this time it's you with the, the, the disease. This time it's you with the heartache. If you allow that day to bring you closer to the Father, rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 119.71 mentioned it already. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Why? That I might learn my statutes. I look at all the tough times in my life, and if again, you would have came to me on those days and said, Pastor, how do you feel right now? Good day. I said, you're crazy. Bad day. Bad, bad, bad. But I look back and I realize how many times those days drove me to my knees and sometimes to my face and drove me before the throne of God and it's driven me over and over again back to that book right there. And I'll look back right now and say, those were good days, precious days. Oh, I'm glad I had them. And maybe some of you today that don't have enough time to read that Bible this week, you need to have some of those bad days. Because if you don't feel yet you've got enough time to read, maybe when God puts you on your back like he put up Brother Larry Smith last week, and he said, all I can do is lay in a hospital bed and read my Bible like that. Maybe that's what it's going to take. So maybe today, while you don't have that, you ought to rejoice in this day. And say, God, I certainly think I can carve out some time to read that book today. We're three months into the month, uh, in the year now, and, and God, I'm not mad at I, mean, I don't want to see it, but, but, but some of your, your Bible reading cards here are blank. You're too busy for God. And sometimes God in His love for you will give you some of those days to drive you back to Him. Because you are the most precious thing to Him. I certainly want to kind of take advantage of my good days today to say, God, i got some good eyesight today. I can get up and sit at the, the table with a cup of coffee and I can read that Bible and I don't have to be lying in a hospital bed today with it raised up above me. You know what then happens? We, 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 we take all the good days that we have and we don't take advantage of them and then the bad day comes and what do we do? We want to blame God. We want to criticize God. We want to disagree with God. And we certainly aren't going to rejoice and be glad in because we don't understand these principles today. Listen to me and I'm done. I don't have to like my day. I don't even have to agree with it. I don't have to understand it, but I do need to realize those above truths. I do need to realize that God's allowed it and His will is always best. I do need to realize it need, it, it's needed to help me complete my mission. I do need to realize that although it's not the best thing that could happen to me, it could be the best thing that happens to others. I do need to realize it could bring me closer to God and it should bring me closer to God and to His Word. And I do need to realize that through every day I go through, I can trust God in it. And so can you today. No matter how bad your day is. And by day, it's not just this 24-hour period, but what's going on right now in your life. You can trust God in it. And I will never be so foolish, I hope, to come to you and say, this is the best thing that could ever happen to you. You just don't know it yet. Because it might not be the best thing that could ever happen to you. But if you use it properly, it could be the best thing that happens to a lot of other people. So that's how, even in this day, Pastor, even in this day, even on that day of Calvary, we can rejoice and be glad. I hope you will today. Would you bow your heads with me? Our Father, we love you today.